the book of Romans, we're in chapter 12, and this morning we're going to look at verses 9 through 13. They're brief verses, but they are contained with lots of material. In fact, as I was going over this, I thought I could do five sermons just out of this text alone, but uh, we're going to do one, and uh, hopefully keep all these thoughts of the apostle together, because they're all bound together in one idea, and that is that of love. Romans 12, beginning with verse 9, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word, and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Way back in the 1950s, when my parents were listening to Frank Sinatra, he asked an age-old question in one of his songs. What is this thing called love? even ended the song by asking that question to the Lord up in heaven above. Well, the Lord up above answered that question long ago when He sent His Son here below. Love's not romance, it's sacrifice. Laying down one's life for another. Paul said that earlier in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 when he wrote, God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it is sacrifice for the unworthy. But only now after He has given the standard of love, God's love as seen in the cross of Christ, only now does Paul describe Christian love, our love for one another. That's the main subject of chapters 12 through 15. Love is to shape our relationships, those in the church and those outside the church. In verses 9 through 13, Paul explains love in the church, love among the saints. He begins with the exhortation, let love be without hypocrisy, which means that love is to be sincere. Love is to be true. It's to be real. The word hypocrite is really a transliteration of the Greek word that's used here, and it was the word that was used of the stage. It was a word that was used for an actor. Uh, perhaps with that analogy in mind, Paul was saying something like, the, the church is not a stage. The church is the real world, and, and we are to be living the truth. We're not to be pretending. We're not to be living a lie. But uh, counterfeit love is very easy and very common. Men are ingenious in their abilities to fake love, to say the things that give the, an impression that, that they have love, that they really don't possess at all. It's really no different from what Judas did when he betrayed the Lord with a kiss. At best, hypocritical love is a contradiction. At worst, it is satanic. Because it's a lie. And Paul forbids it. Love is to be genuine. It is the motive for what we do as Christians. So love is to be genuine, love is to be sincere, and love is to be discerning. Paul indicates that in the next two exhortations or commands that he gives, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Genuine love does that. Both of these words, abhor and cling, are very strong words. Abhor could be translated hate exceedingly. On the face of it, that may seem 
strange that the exhortation to love is followed immediately by a command to hate. But not really. Love is not sentimentality. It's not blind to evil. God himself is proof of that. God is love. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. That's a verse that uh, we all should know. That's a verse that children should memorize. God is love. But God also hates. Proverbs chapter 6 lists six things that God hates. A lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked schemes, and other vices. Whatever is deceptive, whatever is harmful, God hates it. So if we are to love as God loves, then we must recognize sin and we must hate it. We must abhor it, just as we are to adore righteousness, which is the next statement. We are to cling to what is good. A cling is an intensive word as well. It has the idea of being glued to something or someone, to being cemented together, and it speaks of intimate union. So the, the Christian is devoted to what is righteous and true. Uh, not only righteous and true ideas, but also righteous and true actions. Love is dedicated to other people's welfare, and it isn't genuine if it leads a person to do anything evil. So, to say love clings to the good means that, first of all, it's orthodox. That is, it's true. It loves the truth. It clings to the truth. It, it cements itself, as it were, to the truth, but also to what is moral. It never becomes an excuse for sin. That is love in a very general way. It is astute and it is ethical. It hates evil and promotes good. In the next verses, verses 10 through 13, Paul gets more specific about love. He gives um, the specific ways in which love functions. In verse 10, he explains how love operates in uniting Christians. Paul is very big on unity within the body of Christ and functioning together. And love is what generates that unity. And so right in verse 10, he writes, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. So true love, which is characterized by sincerity and clarity, and what I mean by clarity is it's not fuzzy, it's not uh, in any way unclear, it, it distinguishes between good and evil, always promoting the good, always hating the evil. It is also, as we see here, characterized by commitment. And the commitment to one another is very strong. Paul uses words here that uh, are used of family affection, brotherly love. You know that word, Philadelphia. It was a word that was used by the pagan writers of natural love between brothers and sisters. Paul applies it to the church. We're to have love for one another like one would have for a brother or a sister. The word translated devoted is a combination of two Greek words for love and was used of the love of, of relatives for one another, parents for a child. So this is the kind of relationship that we are to have within the body of Christ. This is the kind of relationship that is to exist within the church, a family relationship. That's a very close relationship. In terms of natural relationships, there's no closer relationship than the family relationship. But in fact, this relationship, this spiritual tie that binds us together is greater than a blood bond within a natural family. This is a supernatural family. This is a family that is joined together by Christ. We've been redeemed by Him. Natural family members have not necessarily been redeemed. We've been placed in Christ in whom we gain life, supernatural life. We are sealed with the Spirit. That sets us apart from all relationships that there are. 
this relationship, this spiritual relationship is stronger than any natural relationship. But the point he's making here is to be as close as that kind of relationship that we associate with a family. So we are to show one another genuine concern and consistent concern. We are to have affection for one another as brothers and sisters. Paul's second exhortation is that we give preference to one another in love, in, in, in honor. There's some question about Paul's meaning here. He, he may mean that we're to consider others as better than ourselves and we're to treat them with preference over ourselves. And that's certainly true to the point that he's making and is uh, certainly biblical. Uh, but this may also have the idea of competition, of taking the lead in honoring others, of outdoing one another in showing honor to others, which is a, a more intensive way of saying that uh, we're to put others first. Either way, we are to show one another the greatest respect. We are to honor one another. The exhortation is important because we are naturally inclined to do the opposite. We are naturally inclined to honor ourselves and become jealous of others. Jealousy is very common. Very, jealousy is, is very powerful. It causes divisions and splits among people. And I'm speaking here generally. You see that characteristically of the world. I'm reading a book uh, on the Lafayette Escadrille, the American squadron that uh, fought in the French Air Service during World War I before America entered the war. And you would think that countrymen together in a foreign land fighting a common enemy would be bound together. They'd be happy to be alive and encouraging each other in the fight because each one's success meant the safety of everyone else. But early on, a rivalry occurred between two of the top American pilots. One felt that he was being unfair, one, was, one felt the other was being unfairly honored over him, was being given a medal that he felt that he should be getting, and so he wrote uh, letters of protest and no doubt caused some dissension within the squadron. What's interesting is not long afterward, both pilots were killed, but even after their deaths, their families continued the dispute. Uh, that's the world. It's self-centered. Pride and jealousy are, are stronger than patriotism. And the reality is that enters the church. This was apparently the problem that Paul was trying to forestall or correct in Philippi, there was a problem of rivalry and jealousy. So in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he wrote, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Look out for the interests of others, he says. Put the other person ahead of yourself. Don't think of yourself first. Love doesn't seek its own. It looks out for others. It promotes others. Just as family members are, are pleased by the elevation of, of, of other members of the family, so too Christians are to be pleased in the same way. We're to be pleased with the, the progress of, of each other. We're not to resist that, but we're to seek it. We're to be a help to others and we're to give them praise when it is deserved. So love is selfless. It is sacrificial. It is moral. It is genuine. That is, that is it is true and it, it is for truth. It's against error. It's against whatever is harmful to others. And it is active. In verse 11, Paul makes three statements or exhortations about love. <clears throat> the first is a, a warning against being lazy. We are not to be 
lagging behind in diligence, he says. That, uh, that might, strike a, might have struck a chord with the Romans. They were people of action. That's usually how the Romans are described, say, in contradistinction to the Greeks. The Greeks were cerebral. They thought a lot. They were philosophers. You see them in, in uh, Acts 17, these uh, intellectuals. It, all they did was sit around and talk about new ideas didn't build things, they just thought about things. And the Romans, on the other hand, were not great philosophers. There were, there were some moral philosophers like Seneca at the time of Paul, but for the most part, they were builders. They were conquerors. They were world beaters and builders. And you can still see what they've built today. You can walk on their roads. You can walk on the Appian Way. I've taken a hike on that, that place, and you can see the tombs that were built long ago along that road and you can go into some of the buildings that they built. Some of that still stands. Not in great shape. It's still some of them are ruins, but um, th they were like people today. They were diligent about the things that don't last or the things that we can't hold on to. So they were active and Paul was urging these 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 Roman Christians to be active, to be diligent, but not about things that don't last, but not about things that we can't hold on to, but about things that are eternal. And he's saying about that, that they were not to be lagging behind. It's similar to what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, where he said, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now that's the problem, isn't it? It's very easy to grow weary in doing what's right. Getting on the right path and staying on the right path. It's so difficult not to grow weary in doing good and then begin to lag behind in diligence. Uh, because a Christian life is not an easy life. Often it's about unseen things and doing things that others aren't going to see and others aren't going to praise because they don't see them. Well, that calls for effort. It calls with a singleness of mind and purpose. Love, as we see from what Paul is writing here and what he writes elsewhere, love requires sacrifice. It is active. But it meets resistance, and eventually there, there are moments of discouragement. Everybody goes through that. So Paul warns against becoming disappointed, distracted, cynical, inactive, giving up. A second exhortation is the, the counterpart uh, to the first. Don't lag behind. Instead, he says, be fervent in spirit. Now that may mean maintain a fervent commitment to the Lord in our own spirits, uh, in, in the human spirit that's been regenerated. In fact, the, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible and that, that's the way they, the editors took it. It's a small s. But pro, Paul is probably referring here, I think, to the Holy Spirit and that has support from the, the next exhortation about serving the Lord, uh, it also has the definite article, the Spirit. The, the two thoughts, though, are, are similar. They're parallel. Paul is urging them, these Roman Christians, he's urging us, he's urging all who, who are believers and read this letter, to yield to the Holy Spirit's influence and leading. To, to uh, allow Him to set us on fire. To open ourselves to His leading and power. That is the solution to spiritual laziness, indifference, drifting, discouragement. As Calvin said, it is the fervor of the Spirit alone which corrects our indolence. And that is so true. I've said it many times, 
Christian life is not a natural life. It's a supernatural life. It's a spiritual life, and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is the fervor of the Spirit alone which corrects our indolence, our laziness, our indifference, our discouragement. Our lives are to be characterized by zeal. We are to be like a pot that is bubbling or boiling over. That, that's the idea in the word that Paul uses here for fervent. We are to be yielded to the Spirit and boiling over, zealous for the Lord and good works, deeds of love. Spiritual fervor in the church has often been criticized. Uh, down through the ages it's been criticized in the um, early uh, movement of the Methodists back in the 18th century. They were mocked and called enthusiasts. That was the word that was used. Enthusiasm. That was a bad word back then. Today we, we it's a very common word that's good, but in, in that time that was a pejorative term enthusiasm. <clears throat> it was equiv the equivalent to being called a fanatic today. And that's how the, uh, the, the critics of Whitfield and the Wesleys labeled them. They, were, uh, they, they left the churches, they went out into the open fields, and they preached, and that was considered enthusiasm. Well, it was, they did that because, first of all, the Anglican authorities barred them from their pulpits because they were preaching the gospel and it was gaining a great deal of following and, and they did it secondly because the churches weren't large enough to contain all the people that wanted to come hear them and so 20,000 people would go out into the fields to hear Whitfield or Wesley preach. Well, one of those men that was accused of enthusiasm was a Welshman named Howell Harris. His, his friends hoped that his studies at Oxford would cure him of his enthusiasm. He described his condition this way. Uh, it, it didn't cure his condition. He said, my food and drink was praising my God. A fire was kindled in my soul and I was clothed with power and made altogether dead to earthly things. Well, that sounds a lot like Paul's condition. He told the Galatians, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world criticizes that. Paul was criticized by that. Paul, you're out of your mind, Felix said, or Festus said to him. And Paul's response was, no, I'm not out of my mind, Festus. I utter words of sober truth. He did. And I, I can say this, I think from the reading of Scripture and from the study of church history that if the world criticizes us of enthusiasm, of fanaticism, then you know you're walking by the Spirit. Because we have been crucified to the world and the world to us. Well, it was that divinely produced enthusiasm that set 18th century England on fire in the Great Awakening and that literally changed the world. Now, Paul has, has told us that uh, there is such a thing as zeal that is not according to knowledge. Not all zeal is good. The Jews had that. He said back in chapter 10, he granted they have a zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. It's not a problem only for the Jews. The church has had that problem as well. In, in Corinth, there was an inordinate interest in the gift of tongues, not the gibberish the, of, moder of the modern charismatic movement, but uh, the gift of speaking known languages. That's quite a, a gift. That's quite an ability to have, to be able to speak a language that you didn't know. To be able to speak Latin or, or Greek if you weren't familiar with the language or one of the Germanic languages or for a, a, a Greek or a Latin to be able to speak Persian you can understand that that would be quite an impressive thing to be able to do. But Paul calls that the least of the gifts. The least of the gifts, but they valued it above all other gifts. Becoming enamored of, of the spectacular but less important at the expense of what may be the mundane, but more important is not unusual. The church has fallen into that 
uh, did in Paul's day and has in other ways. So Paul's third exhortation corrects that, corrects an improper kind of zeal. And he says, he does that by saying we're to be serving the Lord. And that regulates zeal because it, it, it indicates that what the Holy Spirit produces is for Christ. What he produces will have that as its standard. It will be controlled by the standard of Jesus Christ. And what is that? Well, that's humble, selfless service. So that it's not about us, it's about others. It's selfless. It doesn't draw attention to oneself. But, but that not only regulates zeal, it also checks laziness and it stirs up diligence. We are servants of Christ the Savior. That should make us serious about service, which we do in all kinds of ways. So this third exhortation is really broad in its application. It applies to every situation of life. It applies to, to our family life, to husbands loving their wives and wives respecting their husbands, to children honoring their parents and fathers leading their families in, in every way. That takes diligence. Love is, is disciplined, which is sacrificial. Sacrificial of time, sacrificial of effort, and that is an act of love by, by parents to do that, to lead by example and to make the sacrifices that are necessary. But it applies broadly, as I said, this applies to our employment. We are to be diligent workers for those who have employed us, whatever that may be. That is service to the Lord. It may seem mundane, it may seem uh, common, pedestrian or whatever, not greatly spiritual, but it is very spiritual. Everything we do as Christians is spiritual. It's a ministry. It, it's dishonest to be lazy at work as it is to be in your studies of, of the Word of God. Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Now that's the Christian life. Just mind your own business, work hard at what you do. That's a great witness to the world around us. That's the Christian life, an orderly life, a productive and helpful life. It's honoring to God and a good witness to the world. And of course, serving the Lord applies to our spiritual life. We, we must be diligent in that and in helping others uh, to do it. Well, now, that's a, everything we've read so far, everything that Paul has written here is a, is a high standard. And it's, I can guarantee you it's easy to preach, another thing to live it. Who measures up to this? Love is selfless, love is helpful. In verse 12, there are three more exhortations given, and they are closely related to one another. We are to be rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Hope is um, in regard to the future, and we must always be looking to the future. Our, our thinking should never be bounded and limited by the present, by this age, by the time in which we live. It should not be bounded and, and restricted by the world around us, by what is seen. We have been saved for future glory. And our confidence in this life, in the present, in the things that we do and what we experience, our confidence in all of that is based on God's promise that, that we will enter into that eternal glory to come. The knowledge of that is the basis for joy. That is Paul's meaning here. Rejoice, rejoicing in hope means that, that the, the hope of our salvation is the basis or the cause of our joy. So we're to be thinking of our hope continually. 
We're always to have that before us. We're, we're, we're to be living confidently in the present in the hope of God's promises. Because life is full of sorrows. Life is full of challenges. Paul recognizes that in his next exhortation to be persevering in tribulation. Paul was well acquainted with that, well acquainted with affliction. He mentions his afflictions in, in other places in, um, in his writings. But Luke does as he traces Paul's life um, in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Paul was a realist. He never tried to paint a rosy picture of the Christian life. We will suffer in this life. He wrote that back in chapter 8 and verse 35 of Romans. Tribulation, distress, persecutions, and other things, he said, is going to be characteristic of this life. It's not going to separate us, he says, from the love of God, but we will experience those things. So we must be ready to endure that, to persevere under it, and hope helps us to do that, the hope of heaven. We, we couldn't persevere in tribulation if we didn't have hope. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that if there is no life to come, if there's no resurrection to come, no hope, then we Christians of all people are most to be pitied. We won't persevere. Now, the world recognizes that, the importance of hope. Napoleon said, more battles are lost by loss of hope than loss of blood. But we have hope. We have a glorious future. And that hope helps us to persevere in trials and tribulations. And if we love, we will have tribulations. Love, love ones suffer. And that that's a trial for us who love them. Loved ones die, and that brings sorrow. In his Confessions, Augustine writes about the death of a, a best friend when he was just a, a, a young boy and the effect that it had on him at that time, that the loss of his friend he <clears throat> caused him, he said, that to, to see death wherever he looked. It, it consumed him. <clears throat> and he concludes from that, that uh, everything in this world passes away. And if your happiness depends on that, then you'll lose it. And so love is to be in the Lord who never passes away. Well, I think that's true. Uh, and the reality is that if, if we are like Christ though we will experience uh, challenges to our love and we will experience the sorrow that comes with it. Uh, uh, friends, loved ones will pass away, we'll suffer sorrow, we'll suffer sorrow in a variety of ways because of our love. <clears throat> C.S. Lewis wrote about that in his book, The Four Loves and How Love Exposes Us to Pain. Love anything, he writes, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, Safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable. <clears throat> In other words, love will die. Now, that's not being human. A genuine human being is a redeemed person. He or she is like Christ in many ways. He's our standard. He's our pattern. And Christ loved the perishing, as no man has ever loved, with unbounded love. And because he loved others, his heart was wrung with sorrow. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept at the tomb of his, of his friend Lazarus. And so if we're like him, then, then we will love much and suffer sorrow because those we love will sometimes fail us and those we love 
will suffer and those we love will die. But we can rejoice in sorrow and we can endure our tribulations because we have hope, hope of the glory to come. When God, we are told, will wipe away every tear from our eyes. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul writes that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. The Thessalonians were suffering this uh, sorrow of losing loved ones. And Paul explains, you, you grieve, but you don't grieve as those without hope. The world has no hope. We have hope. We alone have hope. And hope gives joy and sorrow that in, in, in the midst of sorrow that enables us to endure hardship. So we are to hope, constantly have hope before us. And we are to pray. That's the third exhortation. Be devoted to prayer. Prayer is the means that God has given for securing His grace for strength and endurance. And God's grace is sufficient for every situation. So we're to lay hold of it. We're to to be diligent in prayer. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Now, that means something. And what it means is, if you want the blessings of God, then seek them. You may have to seek them continually and knock continually. It doesn't come immediately. Sometimes it does. But you must be diligent in seeking these things in prayer. That's what the Lord is saying. God hears us when we pray. He desires to hear us pray. And He answers us when we pray. You can't love without grace, so we must pray that God will supply us with that grace. And we're to, to make prayer the pattern of our lives. Only then will our love be correct. Will it be genuine? Will it be selfless? Will it be helpful? There are two other things that Paul says we need to do. In verse 13 he writes that we are to be contributing to the needs of the saints and we're to be practicing hospitality. Very practical injunctions that Paul gives here. It's a call for Christians to put love into practice in very practical ways. The, the word contributing is the word for fellowship. Paul was asking the congregation to have fellowship with the needs of the saints, to uh, participate in their needs. They were material needs, those of, of food and clothing and shelter. So we, we are to share our material goods with Christians who are in need. Do that as a church. We give out gifts where we think it's needed, but we're to do that personally. When we see a need, we're to help. Love takes care of the needs of others. And one, one important way in which that was to be done in the, in the early church, it's true for us as well, but was particularly true in, in that age, was by showing hospitality. And I say that was particularly true in the age of the apostle because th there were few ends in that day and where there were inns, they were often unsafe and unsanitary. And so it was necessary for Christians to open their homes to travelers. Paul says, practice this. And that is a forceful word. It means really to pursue this. We're to be aggressive in this. We're to be aggressive in showing hospitality. And that's to characterize every aspect of Christian love. We're to pursue it. True love reveals itself in, in attitude and action. It is discerning. It is moral. It is uh, devoted, committed to Christians. It is warm and joyful, encouraging and, and helpful. And it's to be seen by others. After Jesus stooped down and washed his disciples' feet in the upper room, he told them, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Love is service and sacrifice. 
Romance is a kind of love, but this is different. It is the mark of the Christian. Shouldn't the world see that in us? The world is lost. It's confused. It is in spiritual darkness. And, and for millennia, it has been asking the question in one way or another, what is this thing called love? It doesn't know. Well, we should be the visible answer to that question. You've heard me quote the ancient uh, church father, Tertullian. Um, one of, he, was a, he was a lawyer and a man very gifted in language, and he has some very interesting statements that he made all through his writings, but one of the most famous is, is really not his statement at all, but he reported what the pagans said about Christians. He said they were saying, see how these Christians love one another. And he adds a little note to that, because they don't do it. That was the main reason for Christian success in the establishment of the church in pagan Rome. Christian charity, Christian love. It should characterize our lives because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts, Paul said. That's true of every believer. And if God has poured out his love into our hearts, we're to pour it out as well. The greatest example of that, again, is uh, uh, of love is, is that of Christ and his sacrifice. And we have... Um, we who have been redeemed by him, saved from the power and penalty of sin, should desire to emulate him, to show his love, the love that he showed to us, to those around us, to the church and then to the world. Jesus laid aside the glories of heaven to become a man, lived a perfect life, and offered himself up as a spotless lamb and a bloody sacrifice for sinners, so that all who believe in him are forgiven and given life everlasting. Well, that is love. Have you experienced that love? Have you believed in him? If not, you're lost. You're lost now and you'll be lost for all eternity. Come to Christ, believe in him. He receives all who do. He forgives and gives eternal life. May God help you to do that and help all of us to emulate this, to love one another. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do hope that you, will in, that you will enable us to do that because we cannot do this, what Paul has described, apart from your grace and mercy. So we seek that, and we pray that we would live lives that honor Jesus Christ, honor you, and are a blessing to one another, loving one another with love that's genuine and helpful. Make us that kind of people. We thank you for your love for us poured out on the cross of Christ. We thank you for him and his death, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.